No, we did. So I've done episodes of our podcast on uh, love attachment and relationships, uh, which is a fascinating literature, mostly from psychology, but also bio biological literature. Um, and that's mostly about people's orientation toward attachment. So they're just very quickly. There's the so-called secure attached style. This typically emerges in childhood when there's a very predictable care um, caregiver carry a uh, relationship between child and most often mother but it can be father too or other caregiver just so happens that the classic experiments were done on mothers because this was in the 1970s and there weren't as many reverse role you know homes etc there were some but not as many as there are now so that's one style of attachment the parent leaves the child gets a little distraught but then can distract itself doing other things or just simply do other things because they have a high degree of intrinsic knowledge not the thought, but intrinsic calm. The autonomic nervous system doesn't feel any need to ramp up because the mom returns. Then there's the so-called insecure attachment styles, and there are a bunch of different ones, but those are the ones where it's really stressful when the parent leaves. It's not clear they're gonna come back, and when they come back, it's not clear that there's, they're gonna reestablish the bond, the child will feel uh, supported, etc. Here's what's fascinating. Those same neural circuits are repurposed for romantic attachment in adult life. The same circuits, which shouldn't surprise us. I mean, why would the brain throw away valuable circuitry? But this whole Freudian notion that, you know, childhood attachment styles map onto adult attachment styles, that's real. That's physiological. Now, one important point, it's not one for one in the sense that, let's say you had a secure attachment to your father. Let's say it's a young, a young girl, and as a baby and a young child, she had a secure attachment to her father and an insecure attachment to her mother. In adulthood, and let's say she's heterosexual, so in adulthood, she prefers men as romantic partners. This girl grows up, and you might say, well, she had a good relationship to her dad, so she's gonna have a good secure attachment style in her adult heterosexual relationships. Ah, often it's not the case. They will transplant or superimpose the insecure attachment style to the, to the mother onto male relationships, but have great relationships to female friends, for instance. So we have to be a little careful to not map one for one. That's important. So all of that is in us. And then you were talking about breakups and we did an episode on grief and the way that grief works in the brain and nervous system is that there are three sort of factors that are mapped in our consciousness and our subconscious. And these are space, time, and this notion of closeness, which is attachment. Space and time is very simple. It's where is the person that I love and when will I see them next? Right? I mean, if you have a relative that lives overseas and you know they're alive, you're not going to grieve them. You might really miss them, but you're not going to grieve them the same way you would if suddenly you get the note, unfortunately, that they passed away. And then attachment is how close you are to them, like how critically you rely on them for internal control and support. And that doesn't mean they have to be an immediate caregiver. It could just be like a really good friend. You call them mates over in the UK, right? Like a really good friend that just your knowledge of him just makes you feel good. You feel better in the world. You know, as a guy who mostly grew up with you know, kind of a big pack of male friends, I mean, I feel strongest and happiest and most secure in life when I see something about one of my friends doing well in life. It just makes me feel good. If one of them dies, and unfortunately, I'm getting to the age where a number of them have died, then you feel like all of a sudden, like, goodness, like there's a loss internally, right? Okay, that's all sort of obvious. But what's interesting is that the grief process itself is about restructuring this map this map think of it like a tripod it's got three pieces space time and closeness when someone dies it's very confusing for the brain because where are they in space well the body is put someplace maybe it's cremated maybe it's not we have notions of a spirit and that depends on one's orientation a soul or a spirit okay or if you don't then you don't then then where do they go right and then time when will you see them again there's the never, you'll never see them again. And the closeness component remains. And so there's an untethering of this map. And so there's been brain imaging studies, um, beautiful work by uh, Mary Frances O'Connor at University of Arizona, showing that if you look in the brain and people that are in grief from loss of a really strong attachment, the state of brain and body that gets flipped on is a motivational state. It's exactly the same circuitry in the brain that one sees active if someone very hungry is put just outside the wall of some delicious food or if an animal that really wants to mate i guess mate with animals you call it copulate they really want to copulate with another animal is put just beyond the wall of that animal animal but they can smell them 
I mean, these are highly motivated, desiring states. So grief is a motivated state to, to bridge the distance in time and space, and yet it's impossible. And so the process of grief is a gradual waning of that motivation and a gradual shift of the memory of the person into some concept, whether or not it's a soul, whether or not it's just the past, whether or not it's their energy, you know, again, it depends on what the forebrain of that particular person believes, shifts that concept of that person into a place where the brain is comfortable. There's no more autonomic arousal. There's no motivation. And we've all experienced this. If you've had a loss, and I've, I've had a loss, for instance, where my graduate advisor died and I adored her. And every once in a while, her daughter will call me from her cell phone and she kept the same number on that ph phone and the name and everything. So every once in a while it'll ring Barbara Chapman and I'll reach for the phone and then there's this moment where I'm like, oh goodness. So anyway, I'm going on and on just to color this with example, but when there's a breakup, it's exceedingly hard, especially if the person is young. You know, if you look at suicides after breakups, those are far more common in younger people than they are in older people. Why? Because the relationship represents the whole future. They have no concept that there are, they know there are other people, but it sort of feels like the whole world is, is shutting down. So in breakups, what's happened is the person is no longer available in time and space. This is why when someone breaks up, you literally have to let them go, right? You know, con constant pursuing of them is out of context, is not healthy. They have a name for that. It's called a stalker. Don't do it. Um, but it's almost as if you have to, the brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space. This has become much harder with social media, right? Because people can check up on people, they can hear from people. In the old days, like when I was growing up, you just like took the phone off the hook or you, you diverted your attention. Now we are constantly renewing that the person is still there. And so love and the loss of love and the death grief are virtually identical. It's that motivational state. And this is why it's so hard to not reach out to somebody that you really miss and want back. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it also rings true with my, my experience and my observations. It, I, I think, I mean, this could relate to a number of things. And here I'm painting with a broad brush, right? But, um, you know, how comfortable one is feeling their feelings, is male or female, is going to strongly dictate how quickly one moves through grief. This is the same thing as trauma. The more willing someone is to feel the full depth and intensity of the feelings that they associate with that trauma, the more quickly they're going to move through the trauma. Uh, again, I'm lifting from Paul Conti's words, so these aren't mine, but you know, people use a number of strategies. They use distraction. They use states like, uh, they sublimate to things like anger um, and avoidance of various kinds in order to not feel the traumatic feelings or not feel the breakup. People will, you know, uh, try and self-soothe with alcohol or try and self-soothe with multiple new partners or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't work. It just extends it because this map of space-time and closeness needs to be fractured. And the only way to do that is for the brain to have to confront the reality, which is that whether by death or by, by breakup, they are no longer available. It's like the food on the other side of that wall is gone. It's just not there anymore. Uh, or that the food that was accessible, now there's a wall in between and you will not get through it. And you know, you can see this actually in animal studies that are kind of hard, they're actually very hard to watch. You'll see the animal perseverate, literally damage its own body trying to get through a barrier to something it's highly motivated to see. People do that post breakup. They usually do that by talking to everybody about the breakup, um, which is its own form of perseverating on the motivation. What did I do? What did I do wrong? This and that. And some of that analysis is healthy. Some of it's not. Now, why would one group be more, uh, let's just say, effective at dealing with breakups, it's probably the ability to really feel the full intensity of how sad it is and be able to confront that. And here, I'm, you know, I'm a male. I've only ever lived in a male body. So all I can tell you is that I think from a very early age, um, there's a, an ability that at least 